Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We are Sustainable Solutions, and we're so excited that you're here for our final senior design presentation. I would ask that you hold all your questions till the end. We'll get all of them answered. I'm Katie Schlotthauer. I'm Christian White. I'm Amicus Kelly. And I'm Anna Blakisha. And our mission statement is designing green solutions for soil and water related problems. In August 2016, the City of Enid and the Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality approached us with an erosion problem on the north facing slope of the Enid landfill. This problem included rill formation, severe erosion, and sparse vegetation. And in other cases, no vegetation after a regrading effort over winter break. The top priority was the risk of trash exposure. If you get too much sediment moving away, you'll have trash exposed, and that's really something we want to avoid. And also, an overall poor soil quality. So, we were tasked with researching applicable erosion control strategies for landfills across the state of Oklahoma, and also developing a site-specific recommendation for that problem slope. Our customers required that we design a solution that covered the slope with vegetation to reduce erosion, that we organized our research in a user-friendly format for other landfills, and also that we were sure to evaluate using on-site materials in our solution. So at the City of Enid, they have a composting program that operates on-site at the landfill. They also have a mountain of wood chips available a stormwater pond that might be useful for irrigation in the future, and also wastewater sludge that's already transported there from the wastewater treatment plant that's just being disposed of in the landfill that could be composted into biosolids and applied as a fertilizer on the slope. So today we're going to go through our research, modeling, and solutions. During our research phase, we made a giant list of all the erosion control products we could think of. We also took soil and water samples at our site and turned them into the OSU Swaffle Lab to be tested. During the modeling phase, we used Russell 2 computer simulation to look at what solutions might be useful to model in our on-site test, which we performed from March 3rd to April 14th this semester. And finally, we'll present our solutions. We have a site-specific recommendation and also an erosion control menu. So each of our erosion control solutions was tested through research, through computer modeling, and also on-site testing. So at the beginning of this project, we were looking at technical papers, we were doing web research, looking at previous studies and patents, anything we could get our hands on that might be a solution for our slope. And what we're delivering today is that site-specific recommendation. We did incorporate on-site materials for free, and um, also our design solution menu, which organizes strategies into categories of the severity and the type of erosion that the solution addresses, the longevity of the solution, and also the anticipated cost. So moving into our research phase, we started with um, our soil samples in October of last semester. Basically what we found was that all of the soil is nutrient deficient at the landfill. You can see that the cover top soil is a little bit more nutrient rich with nitrogen and phosphorus, <coughs> but for the most part we weren't really impressed with the levels we were seeing, even in the compost. We also looked more into what just basic erosion is, and we found that the basic need is to reduce stormwater runoff and increase infiltration of that rainfall into the soil so that you don't get water moving across the surface. Erosion is divided for our purposes into three categories. Um, splash erosion refers to the impact that rainfall has on the soil surface dislodging soil particles and moving them away. Sheet erosion refers to when stormwater has ponded 
and is moving across the surface in sheets and pulling up sheets of the soil. And then in our landfill case, the most intense type of erosion we were dealing with was real erosion. And in that instance, water has formed channels and is carving out paths down the slope. So when we were looking at what types of products address these issues, they fell neatly into two different categories, cover management and support practices. Cover management solutions mainly focus on increasing the nutrient quality of the soil so that natural vegetation can begin to take root and grow. While support practices are a little more intense, um, there's too much sediment moving on your site for vegetation to grow, and so you have to implement some kind of structure to slow the velocity of water and cause sedimentation, for those sediment particles to fall out, so that grass can begin to grow. Moving into our modeling phase, we started with Russell 2, which is a computer program produced by the USDA and NRCS that estimates soil loss. It uses the universal soil loss equation, which has many different inputs, some of which we had to put in ourselves and others which the program automatically pulled from databases. So inputs that we put in ourselves include slope characteristics like the length of the slope and the steepness, uh, climate characteristics like typical precipitation and temperature for Enid in the spring, and also soil characteristics. And we used our soil sampling and also the web soil survey to input those. And those remained constant during every test. But what changed during each iteration was what kind of ground cover we put on the slope and also what kind of structure we implemented, including mulch berms, compost socks, and walks, which we'll talk about later. And this is what we found. The worst thing we could do is nothing. We're losing a ton of soil per year um, with no cover on the ground. And the best thing we could do, as expected, is establish a good grass cover. Even with a poor grass cover established, you're losing tens of thousands less pounds of soil every year, which is important when you're trying to keep two feet of cover on your slope. We definitely wanted to implement solutions on site that encouraged that good grass cover, but we also wanted to test solutions that were support practices, and we saw good results with the compost socks and the wattles and mulch berms, so we made sure to implement those. And now I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Hannah to talk about our on-site testing. <clears throat> All right, so this um, introduces our characteristics and some of the uh, overall procedures uh, for each of the plots. First of all, we decided to use uh, six different plots, and this includes a control plot. So we had five different erosion control uh, materials or structures. Each plot was 10 foot wide by 40 foot long, and each one was hand seeded with a seed mixture provided by Johnson Seed Company. There was about seven different species of grass included in this mixture, and we sprinkled that over um, all of the plots. We also did not add any fertilizer or irrigation water. The main reason for this is because we did not have a hydro seeder machine available to us at the time. There also wasn't a good way to get the irrigation water um, up on the slope, and so we decided to just leave those constant um, and not add anything extra to the plots. Then for simplicity, we used five gallon buckets and a front end loader to uh, measure out our materials and transport them up the slope. Our testing started on March 3rd. We installed um, all, of the, all of the plots on March 3rd and began our testing. And then after one week, we came back and took our first uh, data points. Then after week, week three, we took our second data points. And after week six, we took our third data points. And after that six-week mark, we cleaned up our uh, materials and concluded our testing phase. And we wanted to evaluate the success of our plots in two different ways. The first one here is the erosion evaluation. We did this by uh, staking erosion pins in the ground flush with the surface. And this would allow us to estimate soil loss over the entire plot. 
So we could use a ruler and actually just measure uh, from the, the top of the erosion pin down to see how much soil was lost over the course of the entire testing period. And this would allow us to average those results to get an understanding of the severity of sheet erosion. We also uh, looked at the cumulative results over the entire duration of our testing. We also wanted to look at success through, or through vegetative cover. And this was done by estimating the total canopy cover on the plots themselves. We divided the plots into two different sections, top and bottom, and then we took photographs of those sections. We imported that into Adobe Photoshop, and that allowed us to extract the total number of green pixels in the image, as well as the total number of pixel, pixels overall. And we only included uh, what was in the plot boundaries itself. We added those uh, respective numbers to each other uh, for each image, and that allowed us to divide the total number of green pixels by the total number of pixels in the image, and give us a percentage of green in the image. And that allowed us to estimate the total amount of vegetative cover over the entire plot. And this um, moves into our procedures phase for um, all of our plots. The first one here is our compost blanket. This one was hand seeded first, and then we applied a one and a half inch layer of the on-site compost evenly over the entire plot so that no bare surfaces uh, could be seen. Then we installed erosion netting over the entire plot in excess of five feet below and five feet above the plot to um, help control any sheet erosion or movement of that compost off the plot. And then we secured the netting with four inch garden staples. This is our control plot, and as you can see, there's nothing on it. Um, so we hand seeded this one, and then um, we left it bare, but we did add the erosion pins so that we could use uh, this plot to compare with our other plots. Um, you can see from this image uh, just how rough the soil is and kind of what we were dealing with. Then this one is our manufactured compost socks. We were able to acquire materials from uh, Minic Materials in Oklahoma City. They gave us some compost blanket or compost uh, sock netting uh, with an eight inch diameter and it was pre-filled with compost that they provided. And um, each of these were in 10 foot lengths and we decided to use four of them uh, from the recommendations from the Russell modeling that we uh, did earlier. Um, in the semester. So we placed the first compost sock at the very top of the plot, and then each of the others were placed at 10 foot intervals down from there. Then we staked them with two foot uh, garden stakes at either end to secure them in place. This is the homemade compost socks, and these are very similar to the manufactured ones. Uh, we acquired the same material, and this time we actually stuffed them ourselves with the on-site compost. Um, and so that's the difference between uh, those two plots. Then we followed the same procedures, placing them at 10 foot intervals uh, with the first one at the top, and we staked them in the same manner. The fifth one is our wattles uh, plot. And wattles are long uh, tubular um, formations that um, are filled, they're a netting that is filled with either mulch or sometimes you might see them in, with straw in them. We decided to use the on-site wood chips and we acquired um, our netting material from ASP Enterprises in Wichita, Kansas. Um, the only issue with this plot, as you can, might be able to see from this image, we only have two walls. And the reason for this is when we went out to do our original um, staking of the plots, we were going to do 40 square feet of plots um, and so instead, once we got there and saw how much uh, space we had and how um, fairly even the surface was, we uh, decided to go ahead and do 400 square feet. And we didn't have enough time to get more netting, and so we kind of worked with what we had. We had two 10-foot long sections of this netting, and then we hand-stuffed them with the on-site wood chips to fit a 6-inch diameter. Um, then we placed them about 13 feet and 26 feet down from the top and they were staked on either side at an angle to secure them in place 
And the reason they weren't staked in the center like normally is because we couldn't actually get the stakes through the center because of the large wood chips. Then finally, this is our biosolids and wood chip plot. This one was kind of fun. Uh, we actually drove down to Midwest City and acquired some Class A composted biosolids. Um, part of the reason that we did this is we were wanting to use on-site materials, uh, but we didn't have enough time to adjust um, our design to fit compliance. Uh, Class B biosolids, um, you have some detectable levels of pathogens, and we didn't want to have to uh, deal with that um, during our implementation, so we decided to use the Class A composted biosolids. Um, Midwest City has a commercial uh, composting facility on site, um, their wastewater treatment plant. So we actually, that's why we drove down there. Um, and this, this is completely safe to handle and we didn't have to worry about any uh, restrictions. Um, so this one, we mixed with on site wood chips. And the reason we did this um, is we found a study last semester that recommended uh, putting biosolids in combination with mulch. And this actually helps prolong the nutrient release um, of nitrogen. And so we decided to uh, mimic um, that procedure. We also um, we laid out the, uh, the seed first, and then we uh, raked the biosolids and wood chip mixture over the plot and kind of incorporated it all together. Um, netting was also staked over this entire plot, similar to the compost blanket. Um, and it was staked with the four inch guard snakes around the entire edge. Then we went ahead and built a mulch burn, as you can kind of see in the bottom of this image. And this was just to help with any of the uh, sediment that came off of the plot or um, any of the leaching nutrients um, that may come off. We didn't want it to be getting into the stormwater pond or uh, leaking out anywhere else. <coughs> So this is some of the calculations that we did to kind of decide how much biosolids and how much wood chips we wanted. We wanted to follow um, a recommendation to apply biosolids um, at a rate similar to a nitrogen fertilizer. So we were given a recommendation to apply uh, from Johnson Seed Company to apply fertilizer about 75 pounds of nitrogen uh, per acre. And we found that the Midwest City compost, biosolids compost, had 34 pounds of nitrogen uh, per dry ton of biosolids. And so uh, we converted that to how much we needed for each plot, or for our one plot. Uh, and this came up to 60 pounds total. And we assumed about a 36 36% mineraliza 36 mineralization rate. And that means that the nitrogen would kind of break down. It's usable for the plants but it would probably wash away before the plants, the grass seed could actually get established. And so we wanted to add a little bit more um, so that they would have enough nitrogen uh, to actually get established. Then we used 107 pounds of wood chips. And this was um, according to that recommendation of the study that I mentioned earlier. We also added about 25 pounds or 25 gallons uh, of soil. And this was just to kind of give some substance um, to the mixture, as well as allow uh, something for the biosolids to cling to and not be washed away. So a key part of our project was to keep costs as low as possible. Initially, when we first started the project, we expected to spend about $2,400 throughout the course of the project. However, we only ended up spending about $840. This is largely due to the fact that we received a large amount of donations from both uh, in forms of supplies and materials. And another key thing to consider is that if the city of Enid or any other landfill in the state of Oklahoma was going to implement one of these design solutions, they would not be spending such a large amount of money on travel-related expenses. So we visited the plots at weeks one, three, and six and during each of these visits, we measured the amount of soil loss, and we also took photos to document the amount of vegetative cover that had been established. So, what did we discover? Uh, our compost blanket was actually our best performer. <coughs> it had the highest amount of vegetative cover. There was a low degree of sediment loss. There was some minor erosion at the base and at the top of the plot. However, it was very minor. So it was very important to this study to have a control for two main reasons. The first reason that we decided to have a control is so that we could see what would happen to the landfill if we did nothing. 
And also another reason that we decided to have a control group was to see, uh, to have a basis for comparing the sediment loss data and the vegetative cover establishment. So as expected, this plot did not have a very high degree of vegetative cover established on the plot. And also there was an even distribution of soil loss throughout the face of the plot. And there was a single form, a single rill that started to form at the base of the plot. On our third plot, we decided to implement manufactured compost socks. We actually had some pretty interesting results with these. As the sediment washed down the face of the slope, the compost socks trapped the sediment, and this created a nice terracing effect. Um, however, one negative consequence of this particular design is that we left some gaps in between the compost socks. And as a result, this created some rills on either side of the compost socks. It's important to note that if the city of Enid or any other landfill was going to implement compost socks, that these rills would not be formed because the compost socks would be, formed, would be uh, installed parallel to the base of the slope. On our fourth plot, we implemented homemade compost socks. The main difference between the homemade compost socks and the manufactured compost socks is that the uh, homemade compost socks were filled with on-site compost rather than compost from manic materials. Uh, we had similar results. Again, we got this nice terracing effect. However, there was one main difference between the homemade compost socks and the manufactured compost socks. As you can see on the second compost sock, there were starting to be some undercutting, and we think this may be due to a variety of reasons. Possibly the soil was not compacted enough underneath the sock when it was first installed, or possibly uh, due to the nature of the homemade compost socks. They're not as uh, firmly compacted, they're a little bit looser than the manufactured compost socks, so they're not as strong as the manufactured ones. On our fifth plot, we implemented the homemade wattles. The grass growth was a little bit taller than the bee control, however, it still was not, uh, not very great, as we had hoped. Um, again, we got this nice terracing effect, however, it was not as pronounced as with the compost socks. We think this may be due to the fact that the wattles are more porous than the compost socks, so the, as the sediment ran down the face of the slope, it did not capture the sediment as well, however, it just ran like straight through. And on our sixth and final plot, we implemented a combination of biosolids with a mulch berm constructed at the base. And this was actually our second best performing plot. It had the second highest amount of vegetative cover and a fairly low degree of sediment loss. Uh, what we have here is a closer look at the mulch berm. Uh, you can see that it did a really great job of capturing the sediment and it might be a good uh, solution in the future to help capture sediment as it runs down the face of the slope. So we went back to the plots at weeks one, three, and six to measure the sediment loss. And at the end of the six weeks, we added up the total amount of sediment loss to determine how much soil had been lost from each plot throughout the duration of the experiment. And what we discovered is that the compost blanket and the biosolids plots had the lowest amount of sediment loss. We think this may be due to a variety of reasons, mainly due to the fact that both of these plots had erosion control netting applied to the face of the slope. We think that this did a great job of keeping the soil on the slope. And another reason that there was a lower degree of sediment loss for these two plots, possibly due to the fact that they both had nutrients added, and this helps establish the vegetative cover, which also helps keep the soil on the face of the plot. So when we were looking into the literature, there were a couple of different ways to quantify vegetative cover, one of which involved uprooting the vegetation and weighing it after growing the grass. And unfortunately, we did not want to go this route because we did not want to tear up the grass that we had worked so hard to grow. And so we decided to go a different route to quantify the vegetative cover. Uh, what we did was we uh, counted the total number of green pixels and divided that by the total number of pixels in each photograph and we used this to determine the amount of canopy cover. And uh, what we discovered is that the compost blanket and the biosolids plots had the highest amount of vegetative cover. And this further confirmed our observations that these two had the most grass. And we think that this may be due to the fact that both of these plots had nutrients added. So what type of obstacles did we encounter along the way? 
Uh, initially, when we first started the project, we had a couple of issues with communication and chain of command. Basically, it just took us a while to figure out exactly who we needed to talk to in order to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. Another great lesson that we learned during this project was how to deal with compliance issues and environmental regulations, and that's definitely going to help us in our future careers. Um, and also, uh, weather was a key constraint in this project. Due to the variation of Oklahoma's weather, it's kind of hard to predict how much rainfall we will receive, and um, perhaps if we had more rainfall, we might have gotten more grass. And uh, another constraint in our project was with distance. If we were located closer to the landfill, we definitely would have visited more often. And if we had visited more often, we would have had uh, more data points and possibly a higher degree of accuracy with our data. And another thing to note is that um, due to the limited nature of our schedules, uh, we had a bit of limitations with time. We only had about six weeks to uh, implement on-site testing. So now I'm going to turn it over to Chris to give you our recommendations. So after analyzing our results, we decided that a combination of um, adding nutrients to the soil and adding a design solution that would slow water as it came down the slope would be best. And we recommend doing this by adding on-site materials. We would recommend adding the compost that's on-site for a compost blanket and using the mulch that's on-site for mulch berms to go across. We were initially worried that the on-site compost wouldn't be nutritious enough to support vegetative growth, but our tests showed that it did. So the cost analysis, we based it off of about a two-thirds area, and we did this because there is some established vegetation down on the bottom and up one side of our slope, and we believe that if we could add a design solution that encouraged vegetative cover on the two-thirds critical area, that we would encourage vegetative growth along um, the whole slope. We did not include labor costs in our cost analysis, but we will be comparing them to the do nothing option, which is a reoccurring monthly fine of $500 to $1,000 if an erosion um, problem persists. So this is just a picture of our on-site critical area. You can see the area that would be considered our critical area and some of the vegetative growth that is established along the bottom end of the side. This is just a diagram to help um, better picture where we're hoping to place the mulch berms. We'd recommend that they get placed at 100 and 200 feet from the top of the slope. And then later, if the water velocity seems to be still too strong, placing them at 50 and 150 feet. And as you can see, the mulch berms kind of um, angle up on both sides, and that is our way of helping to avoid the rail formations on the sides as the water tries to um, take its path of least resistance down the hill. So I'm going to break the cost analysis up into three separate sections. The seed section, um, we got these numbers from Johnson Seed Company, and they break their rates down into a landscape rate and a critical rate. The landscape rate is for areas that have some established vegetation, so we would fall under the critical rate. For the nutrient blanket, we included cost options for a low, medium, and a high. We obviously recommend the low option. Um, it does get to utilize on-site resources. But we included the medium and low, or medium and high options because we do believe that a higher nutrient quality could um, help quicken your results. Plus, we also know that Enid has a really great composting program that allows members of its community to use the compost, and we would no longer recommend using this option if it were to be an end to that program. For the support practice, we included cost analysis for the homemade mulch berms and the manufactured waddles. We did include the waddle option in case um, the homemade mulch berms would not want to be made, but due to the price difference and on-site resources, we definitely recommend using the homemade mulch berms. So we wanted to be able to provide erosion control options for areas and landfills in Oklahoma that we didn't get to know as well as our Enid site, and we decided to do this by creating our erosion control menu. And it works like a flow chart that goes through the different types and severity of erosion, different cost options, longevity, and things like that. The menu also has little descriptions, um, short descriptions of the design solutions to help you best decide what would be perfect for your erosion control issues. So the first section of the menu is under low severity. This is often due to splash erosion, and you can kind of notice splash erosion by a crust forming on the surface. To fix this, you need to add nutrients so that there can be some vegetative growth that can ultimately help reduce rainfall impact. 
The second section, the average severity section, this is usually due to sheet erosion, and this usually has some small um, amounts of vegetative cover, but it also has um, roots starting to show as they're being uprooted. And to, this needs a little bit more of a severe um, approach. It's going to need nutrients to help encourage vegetative cover, but it's also going to need um, a support practice added that will either slow the water velocity or channel it in a different way altogether. And for extreme severity, this is often real erosion where there is no vegetative cover and the water has started to channel into the soil and the slope. This needs um, added nutrients to help vegetative growth. It needs to the rails that are previous to be filled, filled in, and it needs um, support practices to help slow the water velocity. So we like that the erosion control menu can be used to help identify a problem and decide what solution will be the best, but we also hope that it gets used in a proactive manner um, where if there's reoccurring issues or when new cells are being built at landfills, that these design solutions can be implemented to stop erosion before it even starts ultimately saving time and money. In the future, we hope that Ina can continue to watch our plots. We did um, leave our design solutions up on site so that they could be watched into the future since we had to cut our testing short. Um, we do think that some of the information that we've collected could be used for further planning, like knowing that the topsoil is slightly more nutritious, if it could be held back and only used on the exterior slopes and not as daily cover, that could be helpful. And then also as um, new cells are being built, if compost can be incorporated so that possibly we would avoid adding a compost blanket in the future. We also think it would be a great opportunity for Aiden in the future to look into stabilizing the biosolids that come through their facility. Um, this would help provide another great source of nutrients and reduce the amount of biosolids that are lost as waste. And um, finally, we hope that the menu is continually updated with trending solutions so that the best available options are always available. We wanted to thank everyone who's answered our questions or donated time or resources or funds for us and anyone who's helped guide us along the way. Thank you for coming to our presentation. Does anyone have any questions? It was a mix of, I think, about seven different seed varieties. Um, in the, the report, there are USDA plant fact sheets that tell you more about the different varieties, and we also have the like mix from Johnston if you'd like to look at it. Okay. So it seemed like the um, burns basically performed lower or at the control plot. Why is that? The compost socks? Uh, yeah, and the waddles. So both of them. Yeah, right. for, the, for the soil lots and vegetables. Yeah, that was very frustrating <laughs> for us. Um, first, I would like to clarify that quantifying our sediment loss was more difficult than we anticipated. We expected to measure the amount of soil that was lost over time. And when we came back, some of our stakes were covered with soil, and we didn't think about how we could measure that sediment shifting. And we didn't want to dig down and right. cause more <laughs> erosion by finding them. And so our numbers are a little skewed. Um, also, I'm not sure we have a good picture here, but I can show you at the demo. Um, the surface, soil surfaces above the pots were not equal. And so we could have had more sediment moving over those particular pots. There were some like rills already starting to form from where our front end loader had been, and we think some of the soil above the plots that got like higher velocity channeling definitely affected um, how much soil loss we saw in the plots. Did you did your team take any um, weather element observations, amounts of rainfall, wind, wind direction, uh, dew points, those kind of things? I did pull the rainfall data from the mesonet at the last, um, on the last day of our testing. Um, but basically, you can see here that we got way more rain in between week three and week six. We didn't really see any sediment moving until then. Um, 
and that's all we we'll be tabulating into our experiment. Have you either seen or heard any reports about what it looks like after last weekend? <laughs> <laughs> We didn't end up recommending adding that because we knew it wouldn't be very feasible. We wanted to do it for the plot just for keeping our plots like very singular to their own type. We didn't want things blowing around. But the things that we read said that if we'd gone above two or three inches um, of adding compost or things like that, that we would need to have netting over it. But that if we recommended something smaller, that it would be okay to not have the um, netting on the full slope. So that's why we were able to suggest. And on that point, how did you choose? There are uh, EPA fact sheets for applying compost blankets, and that's, they have uh, different recommendations based on your soil type and stuff like that, other factors like that. I've got a question. So what type of uh, nitrogen is it, and does it have any heat chain? Collection system? No, what type of uh, nitrogen is it? Is it it's like just a dump uh, yeah, they do collect leachate. If you look into using the leachate to grow and grow Yeah, we did briefly look into the leachate uh, in uh, last semester as we were doing our literature study and such. And we decided, uh, especially with uh, the option of using the biosolids, uh, we felt like that was a more uh, I guess reputable option. The leachate a lot of times has a high salinity or other uh, contaminants in it that make it difficult to actually put on a slope. You're, if you're irrigating with it, then you have to recollect it somewhere else. Um, and so we didn't want it getting into the groundwater or other surface water ponds if it didn't meet um, regulations. Once this uh, vegetation is established, did you all look into what type of long-term operation and maintenance uh, costs or uh, reoccurring operation and maintenance to maintain that grass once it became established? Mowing or? We didn't look into like what it would cost to mow the slope. I know that the seed mix that we planted is successful as a chickasha in El Reno, and so we might go to them and ask if they were curious. Um, but really, the maintenance that we looked into would be maintenance like on our compost blanket and on the mulcher. So they might have to be checked after like a big rain event or maybe once a year, fill in places. Any other questions for this group? Okay, let's give them a round of applause.